Good afternoon, everybody. How's everyone doing today? Uh, it's good to see you. Nobody's too asleep after lunch, hopefully. You got some fresh air. Uh, my name is Peter Chittum, <clears throat> and I'm a developer evangelist at Salesforce. Uh, this is Boxcars and Cabooses, and um, if you want to follow me, I am at P. Chittum. Uh, my GitHub account is P. Chittum as well. Uh, who here knows anything about Salesforce at all? Oh, a few of you, great. Um, so, uh, have you seen this slide before? So this is a little Salesforce ritual. If you've never seen it before, it's called the Safe Harbor Slide. We're a big publicly traded company, and uh, before we talk about anything, uh, we're obliged to just say, uh, if I talk about something that isn't already generally available in the product, uh, it may never be. That's all. Uh, so don't make any purchasing decisions on anything that I say that isn't already generally available. Uh, so now that we've dispensed with that, if you want to read the whole thing, uh, it's on our investor relations website. Feel free to. I'll be honest, I never have. Um, so I'm going to start with a little story here. Uh, we have uh, Anna, and Anna works at IT for a small company, and what they do is they go out and they service office machinery, and so they have some field reps that go out and do this, and her business has asked her to build an application that's going to track the cases that they service. Uh, it's going to do some scheduling for those service um, uh, calls. It's also, of course, going to do some analytics, and of course, they want it to be on every aspect ratio possible for web, right? So uh, the nice thing is Salesforce does this really well, um, but it poses some very specific problems. And we have a few extra problems because of our architecture. And that's kind of what I want to talk to you about, where if I have a composite web application that's uh, fairly complex and has lots of features and functionality that's connected to a back-end web service, um, how do I optimize these so I don't have so many of them? Right? That's the idea. Sound good? Excellent. Yeah, I have a, very, a few very basic goals today. The first one um, is hopefully just to suggest some design principles to you. So if you're out either building a client framework or maybe you're writing an API, um, maybe you can take some of the things, that, some of the, the ideas that we've started to build into our implementation uh, and apply them to what you're doing. Um, I am a developer evangelist, so of course I want you to start using Salesforce's platforms. Um, now, the nice thing is, as a developer evangelist at Salesforce, I have nothing to sell you. In fact, if you decide to adopt Salesforce, the, the likelihood is that, is that you're going to have something that you can sell on because our customers need developers. Uh, I would guess, just like a lot of uh, space in IT, there's a lot of work being left on the table from our customers needing good developers, um, building solutions for them. Um, so there we go. Um, and when I come and talk to devel developer conferences, I always spend... Uh, I try to spend about five minutes just kind of giving some background as to what exactly it is we offer. Because uh, if I bring up Salesforce, how many of you are going like this? Yeah. So what the heck is Salesforce? Yeah. Um, how many think of Salesforce as that big CRM company? OK, so that's not too bad. How many of you think of Salesforce as Enterprise and business application platform. Fewer, a lot fewer, right? Uh, when in reality, that's how we see ourselves. More than anything else, we see ourselves as a platform company. Now, one of the ways that marketing likes to show people what Salesforce looks like is this. It's very clever, the circles in the cloud. You guys don't get it, yeah? Uh, so there's the sales part, the service part. So these are applications as a service that we provide, um, but they're also built on a platform, and we have opened up that platform to build applications. Now, another way that we often represent ourselves to people is like this, and that's way too much information. Uh, but suffice to say, we have a lot of tools in our toolkit if you're going to be building business applications, uh, either business applications facing employees, so sort of internally facing, or business applications facing your customers. We can do both. Uh, the reality is that if you look at that app part of our little cloud, circle cloud thing, um, it's comprised of two distinct platform architectures. The one is called force.com, and that's the one I'm going to spend most of my time talking about today. But uh, it wouldn't be a, a, a talk of Salesforce if I also didn't address our other platform, which is Heroku. 
Um, so for any of you out there, who is it, for whom is it news that Heroku is Salesforce? So how many of you are already using Salesforce? Everybody who uses Heroku, raise your hand, because technically you are. Um, now, what's the difference between these two architectures? Um, Heroku is really uh, an elastic architecture platform. It's very developer friendly. It basically surfaces an API that is, uh, gives you access to a Git repo. You deploy your app to the repo. It looks to see what that app looks like and if it finds certain artifacts. So maybe it finds a pom.xml or maybe it finds a package.json. It says, oh, hey, that's a Java application or that's a Node application. And it goes in, it looks at the dependencies, it builds all of that for you into a nice little container, mounts it up, gives you a URL, and you have your application. It's very smooth uh, to go as a developer and deploy apps to Heroku. We take care of a lot of the provisioning uh, that you would normally have to do manually if you're using Amazon S3, which is our underlying service that we use. Okay, so that's Heroku. Uh, now, of course, because we're Salesforce, we build a lot, of, uh, a lot of connections between the Heroku environments and Salesforce so that our customers can use Heroku as well. So what about this force.com thing? Force.com is a very different architecture, uh, and it's really intended for internal employee-facing applications more than anything. While we do have some communities-based offerings, uh, you know, those work well under certain use cases, but for highly flexible use cases or highly elastic use cases, where today I have 100 customers coming to my website and tomorrow 100,000, Heroku's a lot better for that because you can dial up and down resources basically by clicking on a button. Um, Force.com is very different. Our customers buy a set of user licenses and they kind of need to know how many user licenses before they go into production. So it's very difficult to do that elastic architecture with Force.com. But what Force.com does really well is scale in a very straight linear fashion. Um, so it's a multi-tenant environment and it uses what's called pod architecture or point of delivery architecture. So essentially that means we install uh, an instance of the Salesforce application stack in a data center somewhere. Uh, that instance has a, a number of app servers and a few database servers, but fundamentally, the app services and the database, even the database schema itself, is shared by all the customers in that particular pod. Uh, so this is actually an advantage to a lot of our enterprise customers because we can tell them exactly geographically where their Salesforce implement, uh, instance is deployed to today. Um, and if we have to move it, which is rare, we tell them and we give them lots of preparation and tools to make sure that that's a seamless uh, process. Um, so essentially, this has allowed us to scale and uh, we have 150,000 customers plus right now on the force.com side of things. Uh, across all of those 150,000 customers, we essentially are running 40 production databases. So that's pretty cool, I think. Um, when I learned about the multi-tenant architecture, I changed from, hey, I'm going to go join this software as a service company to, wow, I'm working with some really cool technology here. So I love talking about it, obviously. Uh, there's some characteristics and some design principles of force.com, single code base, single schema. Um, so we do three releases per year, three major releases, I should say. We have hundreds of small releases that take place uh, throughout the year, several a week, oftentimes. Uh, secure, durable, scalable, and customizable. And uh, the customizable thing is really important. Uh, we have customers that have five users. We have customers that have 5,000 users. We have small mom and pop shops that are using Salesforce, and we have some of the biggest enterprises in the world using us, like Dell and Coca-Cola. And if you go to our website, you can find out who all those people are. Um, so we need those mom and pop shops to be able to customize without having technical skills, but we also need enough flexibility to be able to customize with code and give coders and developers the ability to add to the functionality of the platform. And that's exactly what we do. Um, in fact, we've taken that whole architecture of customization and we've given partners the ability to package up their apps using this architecture. So we have an application marketplace. If you have an idea for a business application that you want to sell to businesses, you can write that app, you can deploy it to App Exchange, it goes through security review, and it becomes a trusted part of App Exchange that our customers might buy. In fact, some of our biggest App Exchange packages are run by relatively small, uh, you know, five to ten developer, uh, uh, five to ten developer shops. 
So that's uh, kind of a, oh, and, and almost 3,000 applications are available with 3 million installs as of today. So there we go. And some more big numbers because big numbers is what we do. Uh, today, across all of our instances on force.com, this is just force.com, no Heroku. On a typical day, we process 3.5 billion transactions. Those are business days, uh, Saturday and Sunday, not really the same. But Monday through Friday, that's pretty typical. And I looked it up on our trust website. Uh, on Friday, we did 3.1 billion. So it was a relatively light day on Friday, if you can call 3.1 billion a light day. Uh, on average, we do 200 milliseconds per transaction. So that's aggregated across all transactions. And 60% of those are going to our APIs. And hey, that's part of my talk today, is using those APIs in a more efficient way. And so finally, as far as what a, an, uh, an environment looks like or an instance, it's about 8,000 customer environments. And we refer to environments as orgs, which is short for organization. Um, and that's comprised of about 30 app servers and eight actual physical database servers. So there we go. Um, I think I've talked enough big numbers. The one thing I will say is that we do have, like I said, one version running in production at any given moment in time. Right? Um, but we're emulating all of the previous 47 versions for our API. So we actually have code that's running today that's executing still successfully against API version 1, even though that was over 10 years ago when that actually was written. Um, so there we go. Now, this kind of poses a very specific problem, because we basically have three sets of developers in any environment um, who have to build functionality without any awareness of what the others are doing. So if you think about it, we have Salesforce's R&D because we build our own applications. Right? We also have our app exchange partners, and of course the customer themselves are, may have a development team. So here's an analogy to think of. Take those three developers and blindfold them. Now uh, take a whole bunch of Legos and stick them in a room and file each developer in one at a time without talking to the other and tell them, go build something cool. And that's kind of a good analogy for what, it, what, you know, what we need to be able to provide so that we can have customers successfully building applications on the force.com platform. Now, there's a lot of things that you can do around making sure that you know, namespaces and that sort of thing don't clash. But what about core application features like server connections? You can see where I'm getting back to with this, I suppose. How do you make three people write an application so that all of those server connections maybe share one connection to the server? And that's going to bring us to the first part of the problem. I'm going to start by focusing on the client side of what we do on Salesforce. So we have a custom user interface framework that's been in place for eight or nine years. It's called Visual Force. Uh, it's been around for a long time, and so it was really a framework of its time. It's server-side rendered. Uh, it sends HTML down to the browser. It's very page-oriented. Um, and you, it has a, a, an XHR type of model, but it's very tightly bundled. And it's sort of linked to the, uh, the markup. So it's very difficult for me as a developer to play nicely with this framework. And we kind of recognized this was a problem about five years ago. Um, in addition to that, client applications were changing the way that they were being written. So uh, you know, browsers were getting more powerful. Uh, Node and jQuery kind of resurrected JavaScript from, uh, from being kind of this sort of corner case language. Uh, and we realized that we really needed something that was going to be component-based, that was going to be client-side render, and that was going to support modern web navigation structures. And so we built it. Um, so uh, there we go. The, the new framework, and we just launched it about six months ago. It's gone production into our customer orgs. Customers are starting to build functionality with it. Um, essentially, uh, I create a component. It's rep, you know, it has some markup. It has some JavaScript. I store that on the Salesforce servers. And when it's requested, it gets served down as serialized JSON. We deserialize that. And then when we need to render the user interface, we do it on the client side. Um, now, the cool thing about this is this is an open source framework. Uh, so if you go out to force.com on GitHub, that is our engineering open source repository. Now, we are not top to bottom stack open source. Uh, Salesforce was born long before that was popular. And as an enterprise business, it took us a long time to feel comfortable with that, to be honest. Uh, but more and more, we are both contributing to open source projects that are out there. 
uh, in the ecosystem. We're creating new ones. So there's an open source project uh, called Apache Phoenix that we were the originators of, and now it's actually out there as an Apache project. Uh, and this one is one that we kind of quietly launched internally to our own developer community and told them, hey, this is where our user interface is going next. And it, it, was, it was a different world for us. Um, now, we've since taken that open source project called Aura. We've implemented it on the force.com platform. And since we're implementing it and putting it in front of customers, we've gave it, gave it a very clever marketing name. And it's called the Lightning Component Framework, because that sounds flashy, doesn't it? Um, there are some key design principles to the Lightning Component Framework. Obviously, we need to maintain the ability to have uh, uh, functionality and the names of artifacts not clash with other features, so we maintain namespacing for that. Uh, but we also wanted to make sure that things like UI look and feel was not going to clash or leak over into other parts of the user interface, so we've added CSS namespacing as well. That's component, uh, component level CSS namespacing. So I build my component and it automatically generates CSS selectors that just match that particular component. Um, everything is a component, so we don't do any pass-through HTML at all. If I put a div on my component, uh, it's going to then generate that into some JSON that represents div that goes down as JSON to the client and then gets rendered back into a div. Uh, this allows us to do things like make sure that uh, we're compliant with accessibility um, uh, functionality. So we have uh, a whole set of features that allow us to support accessibility um, and the ARIA framework. Um, we wanted to allow for this joint point and click and programmatic customization. Uh, and of course, we wanted to enable our customers and us and our partners to build this composite UI functionality and work on any form factor. So that brings us back to this question of the three blindfolded developers having to build this composite interface. And it's all well and good if I can build my component and it works fine, um, but how can I make that even better so that that component isn't just working fine, but it's working with the other components on the page. Um, so instead of having this scenario where I have my component making one XML HTTP request, and I've got my partner who builds a component, and that bundles up its own XML HTTP request, and all that stuff gets deployed into a customer, and the customer goes in and builds their component. So we end up with contention for what can be, especially in a mobile environment, fairly scarce. Uh, server resources as far as connections. Um, and so what we do is we build an API for that. It's called the Action API. It's a part of the JavaScript API that's, uh, that's in the Aura framework. Um, and what we do is we take some server-side code. Um, our server-side code is called Apex. Uh, it's a JVM-based domain-specific language that just runs in the force.com environment. Looks a lot like Java, a lot like C Sharp. So I create a method in Apex, I annotate it so that it's going to be made available. Uh, and then I can get a handle to that in my client side code. And the way that we've abstracted this is through something called the action service. So I have these different components that are bundling up these server side action requests. And as the event queue goes through and processes, it might collect two, three, four, five of these requests to the server and stick them in a queue. Um, once the event queue is emptied and it comes to a pause, it will then take a look and say, hey, I've got some actions. It'll bundle those up into one single XML HTTP request, and it'll send that off to the server. And we refer to this as box carring, and that's the name of the talk. Um, so box carring is the bundling of many server requests into one XML HTTP request. Now, uh, we also realized there was a second use case, and that is, what if I've got um, a feature that's maybe doing some telemetry and trying to understand how my user is using my application, or perhaps uh, it's maybe doing some logging, and I don't want to have to fire off a request to the server every single time something like that happens. Uh, we created a, an API that allows us to postpone the request being sent, and the API is called set caboose. So there we go, cabooses. Um, so if I do set caboose on my action, it goes into a different queue that is essentially saying, yes, I need this to go to the server, but I will wait. I will wait until a real action takes place. So I have one component that's maybe discovering information about user, uh, user interaction, or maybe it's doing some logging. Um, it sticks those into one queue, and then 
the next time a real action, we'll say, or a non-caboose action fires off or gets put in the queue and the event queue empties out, uh, we take all of that stuff and we send it off to the server as one single XML HTTP request again. So this is how we're doing our optimizing of server resources. Now, um, what does this actually look like in code? Uh, if you take a look here, uh, you can see that that's the annotation at Aura enabled that's going to make this particular method available to my, uh, my client side code. So this is all server side. Um, and essentially, it's, it's creating a place or creating a, a feature that we can then leverage on the client side. Uh, to go and use that on the client side, um, this component.get, um, so component is the handle that's been passed into this bit of JavaScript uh, that to this particular component. Um, and you can see that uh, record measurements uh, is basically the same as, you know, so that's where that name comes from. And the C, uh, the C object is uh, what we call a value provider, so it just represents the, the, uh, the server-side functionality in this instance. So we have this action, there we go, called measure. Uh, we maybe have some parameters we need to pass to the server, there we go. Uh, we can set a callback. Uh, and then finally, the last thing is in queue action. So that's the thing that actually sticks this into the queue and says, okay, next time there's a pause in the event queue, um, go and shoot this off to the server and we're off and running. Um, however, this particular one is a caboose action. So because we did set caboose right there, uh, in fact, this will go into that different queue, it'll sit and wait for something else meaningful to happen, okay? So uh, there we go. Now, I have, an, I have a demo for this, uh, but as I was practicing with the demo, something very strange happened, and I was getting errors. But um, I'll go ahead and show, uh, show this, uh, just for laughs and giggles. So let me wake up my phone here. Uh, this particular component I'm actually using in our mobile application. So uh, everything that we do, we try and make mobile enabled automatically. There we go. And uh, I took uh, a hack from the Mozilla Developer Network uh, that was addressing device orientation. I was sort of curious, how do I get this new client framework to work with device orientation? Um, so I went ahead and built that, and here it is. And essentially what happens is, as the component is, goes through its init, um, it creates a record that we're going to store measurements against. And every second, I have a set interval that is recording the device orientation value. Uh, and then when I click Stop Tracking, um, what should happen uh, is it should go in and take all of those caboose actions and store them. And that's where I'm having problems. Thanks for the tweets, by the way. Love it. Uh, so you can see here, um, there we go. So there's my initial request that's being made to the server. So that's the log that's doing that. Uh, and it's storing this record called wobble right there, right? Because that's what it does, is it wobbles. OK? Um, now, when we're done with that, I can do stop tracking. Now, in theory, what should happen is it should then take all those measurements and store them. But what you will see come through here is insert failed. So I don't know. I was doing something with my code, and I must have mistyped something and then saved it. And uh, the reason I was about two minutes late is I was trying to resurrect my demo, but I failed. So my apologies for that. Um, oh, well, now it's working. How about that? OK, you know, I, I really issue the idea of magic and the whole like demo gods thing, but that's pretty weird. Uh, OK, so, um, so let's take a look here. Yeah. All right, so there's my measurement that is being sent up from the server, or from the client, rather. Um, so it's t taken whatever that is, and it does a whole bunch of those. Um, you can see there uh, the actual rows that were recorded was two. Um, and it looks like, yep, yeah, so that's pretty much it. So there's my two requests, and I should be able to actually go in and see that um, from the client side. So in other words, in the browser, if I go and refresh my, uh, my wobbles, as I call them, there we go. There's number 58. And I can see the, the start time and the stop time. Uh, last time I demoed this was in San Francisco, thus the very strange time that you're getting. 
Uh, and uh, in addition to that, I can also see, doo -doo -doo, where we go, related records, and I can see all the different measurements that were taken uh, throughout the entire time that that was executing. Um, and that basically took exactly two requests to the server. The first one to start measuring, and the second one to store all the measurements and to mark that we stopped measuring. All right. So that's the client story. Is that interesting to anyone? Can you see possibly using that in some of the client apps that you're using, maybe? Obviously, you need a server-side component to that, and that's, that's kind of the bit that, as a Salesforce developer, is a little bit abstracted from you, because we have this server-side implementation that handles that, right? Um, oop, actually, let me do... So a couple of things that we're looking to implement. Um, one is to be able to cache those, uh, the, the data that we get from those requests, and the idea is that I'd be able to flag that action uh, and if it was flagged as a cached action, uh, if I go back to that action, it would first check locally for the data before making a trip to the server and making that all transparent to the developer through the API. Uh, the other one is we're looking at ways that we can prioritize the actions. We can do the full-on delay with Caboose, um, or we can have them all go at once, but we don't have a way of distinguishing like maybe a very important action that we don't want to wait for the event lifecycle to finish and just send it right away. Uh, so we don't have that in place yet today. Uh, but those are things that we're looking to do uh, as far as going forward. So what about the API? Now, uh, Salesforce, as I said, we have a huge number of APIs. Almost as a joke, when I would go to developer uh, events in the past, I would sometimes bring our printed version of the API book, and it was like, you know, that big. Um, because if you're doing enterprise software, you need to be able to talk to other software. You just have to. So we've always been pretty good with APIs. Uh, and in the last five years, of course, we've been adding REST APIs. Um, so if we look at the data-oriented APIs, we have some basic CRUD type of APIs. We have the ability to sync and detect the structure of the environment. So what's the data model? What type of fields are in the different entities and that sort of thing? Uh, we have a bulk-based API that's also REST-based, uh, but that basically you take you know, thousands or even millions of records, ship them off to our servers, and we batch them up for you. Um, and then we have a sort of push-based uh, Bayou protocol API uh, that you can use as well. Um, so on the CRUD side, we have our REST API and a SOAP API. Uh, and the feature that I'm going to talk about really had to do with the REST API, because while the SOAP API had a way to bundle together a bunch of records and ship them off to the server, uh, we never had that with the REST API. So we knew that was kind of a missing feature. Um, but at the same time, you know, I guess my version of the story is that the API team saw what the Aura and Lightning Components team did and thought, God, that's a really good idea. What if I want any client application to be able to do that, as opposed to just this Lightning Components client? Sounds like a good idea to me. Um, and so they built it. And essentially, you know, so this is a fairly common uh, uh, workflow in a client application, where we may post some data to the Salesforce servers. Uh, Salesforce servers oftentimes generate additional information, and so we might then do a get to refresh that data from the server. Uh, and then finally, we might follow up and just do an, get an idea of what the current limits are, because we're cloud-based and multi-tenant, and uh, we make sure that uh, you know, a given environment has limits as far as the number of requests they make. Um, so instead of three separate trips, we thought, well, why not just bundle each of those REST requests into one larger JSON structure? Uh, and ship those all off to the server. And that's what we did. And that particular endpoint is called composite slash batch. So essentially, we're now giving anybody who's writing a client against Salesforce the ability to do the boxcarring thing. Uh, and the way that this looks, you can see that the first one is doing a post. Uh, and there's the URL right there. Uh, the second one, uh, and uh, the second one is doing a get. There's our URL. And then the third one, um, is again doing a get. Uh, actually, this one's doing a describe. There we go. Um, 
Now, one thing about this, though, is that so all of these have the method in the URL, and of course, the post, we need to actually pass in the data that we're going to be posting as well, OK? Um, now, there's a second use case that we thought would be really useful. Uh, this particular one went generally available in the summer, and the next one will be generally available at the end of October. That's another one of those forward-looking statements, if you didn't just pick up on that. Uh, and uh, so a pretty typical use case in business software is I have a parent record, and I need to also store its child record. So a business and all the contacts, or a case and all of the comments, so there's a lot of cases where you have to do this. And so uh, in this instance, we have an example of I have an account, uh, I have the related contacts, and I have maybe some cases as well that might be passed in. And uh, they thought, well, why not actually give a JSON structure that reflected the relationships between these? Because in the past, um, it was actually even worse than three separate requests. If I had one account, and maybe five contacts and maybe four cases, that was actually 10 separate requests that the REST API would be forced to do. And so with the, this new feature called tree, we can basically make one single request. We can nest, I think, up to five levels deep. Um, and we can, uh, at one time, save up to 200 records on a particular call. So we can really optimize those requests uh, going back to the Salesforce servers. And the structure again looks like this. So uh, in this instance, composite tree and then the entity name is the uh, API that we're calling. Uh, again, we're doing this as post. Uh, records is an array of all of the top level records. And then there's a set of attributes. Now, you notice here that I have attribute of type account. There's a, a really critical piece of this API that this, whatever entity this is, has to match whatever the endpoint is on the API. If they don't, it fails. And then we also give you an arbitrary sort of uh, uh, a reference ID uh, because we actually pass back the reference ID um, on save along with the actual record ID on the Salesforce side. So if you're doing this from a, a, a client system that has its own ID mechanism, which you often will be, you can do an automatic mapping between those on the client side. Uh, and we have mechanisms to do this on the Salesforce side as well. Uh, we then have uh, the fields that we're going to be setting, and then one of those fields is a relationship field. So contacts, you can see, uh, has its own records, and then its own attributes that matches what the entity type is, and then, of course, the fields, and same thing with cases. So we can create a fairly complex tree structure so that at once, with one single request, we can, in fact, store quite a bit of data. And of course, not a bad idea to demo this as well. All right, so um, I've done this with Postman. We actually have our own PHP-based uh, kind of toolkit client application, but I thought I'd use something that's more industry-based uh, as opposed to something that looks like Salesforce built it. Um, the one thing that I'll mention here really quickly, so let's say I'm going to go through and do a request for limits. You know, what does that look like? Uh, one important thing is that you do need to pass in an authorization token. Uh, so this is basically my session information with Salesforce. Uh, now, I did this about half an hour ago. Uh, I'm really close. If it's timed out, this may be a very short demo. <laughs> uh, so we'll give it a try, and we'll just see. Ah, yes, invalid session ID. So really quickly, because I actually do have enough time, if you guys will indulge me and bear with me. I'm um, we'll going to go uh, to Workbench. There we go. And we'll go and find my session information. And there's the big old long session string. Do, do, do. We'll copy that. And we'll go back into Postman. Where are you? There you are. And we'll just have to replace that whole big long bunch of stuff with that. And now with any luck, there we go. So this is just a quick get request to find out what are the current limits. You know, a really important one would be the actual API limits that I might be using. Uh, doo -doo -doo. There should be a daily API request right there. So my remaining requests are 14,866. Uh, developer environment just by default gets 15,000 requests per day. That's 
for a developer environment, uh, typically just fine. For a customer environment, we allow for a lot more, depending on how many users that they have, of course. Uh, so that takes care of just kind of seeing what the actual uh, request would be if I was making a simple request. Um, now, what if I was doing one of these more composite requests? And uh, rather than doing every single one, right, so uh, we could perhaps look at the composite um, tree nested request. Again, I'll go in and replace my uh, session information. And we can take a look at what the body looks like. So here, uh, you can see that I've got a set of records. Um, there's my parent account, um, and then a child contact. Uh, and what's interesting about this, if I scroll down a little bit, is that I even have, if that's the right one, yes, I have a child account. So there's a, a tree structure that can exist within account itself. Um, so there we go. And if I now click on send, and you look, yes, we have our correct request coming back, or our correct uh, response coming back. And you can see that for each actual record that I intended to create, we have the, the local client-side reference ID that we can get back to. Uh, and of course, we have the Salesforce ID that we need as well, okay? Um, so that just kind of shows just a little taste of how those APIs are going to work. Now, like I said, this one is still in pilot as of today, or it's in pre-release. Uh, so we don't have any customers hitting this yet. Uh, we probably have some partners that are starting to hopefully think about how they can use this. And there's a couple of things that I've been working on that I'm, I myself am thinking of how I can do this as well, um, how I can use it. Um, and I'm pretty excited because uh, this, I mean, it really does optimize how I can interact with the Salesforce servers. If I can bundle together either this tree structure or this arbitrary set of other sub-requests, uh, and then I can then process that as my response. All right. So, again, uh, it's worth talking a, a little bit about some of the, the things we're thinking about doing with this particular API. Uh, one is we want to actually be able to take parameters from one part of the transaction in the batch request and pass them to other parts of the transaction. Um, so if I have something that represents the account, such as that reference ID, I might want to go back to that account and then maybe do something with that one account record as a subsequent request. Uh, so what we're looking at basically is creating kind of a, a very uh, elementary orchestration layer through that REST API in the future. Um, and that's, that's pretty exciting. We actually already have ways of doing orchestrated APIs, but it requires you to write custom code. And there's always overhead to custom code. We require tests. We require, uh, uh, well, that's the big one, actually. Obviously, you have to write the code. You have to make sure it works. Uh, whereas here, if we can do just some basic orchestration without writing any additional code on the server side, that's really positive to developers who are doing the integration side of things. Um, the last thing that I'll mention is that on the tree API, uh, one of the things that we're looking into is updates. Currently, it's an insert-only API. Um, there's no way to do updates, uh, and we're investigating ways that we can support that in the future. All right. Now, like I mentioned, part of my job is to hopefully interest you guys in uh, using uh, Salesforce. Uh, any developer can have a free for your life version of Salesforce. Uh, in fact, you can have as many of those as you want to. Uh, I myself have more than I can count. And most people who pick up Salesforce and kind of join the Salesforce developer ecosystem, uh, it's the same thing. You, you will oftentimes create many, many different environments. We never charge for them. We don't even take a credit card number. All we need is an email address to send you the authentication email. That's it. Um, so if you're interested, do check it out. Um, and if you s sign in and you think to yourself, how do I use this thing, we have an app for that too. Uh, so we recently created a learning environment called Trailhead, and the URL is right there, if you don't see it in the nice pretty picture. Uh, Trailhead works a lot like Code Academy. 
uh, where you can go in, do a little exercise, learn a little something, click a button, and guess what? We're using the, the same APIs that I was just talking about to check to see whether you built that thing correctly. So we're actually using our own APIs to help you learn Salesforce now, which is kind of a cool story. And uh, in fact, one of the things that I'm planning on using the batch for uh, is one of, the, one of my jobs as a developer evangelist is building some of those lessons on the Trailhead website. Uh, and I can see some really effective ways that I could do better testing of has this particular developer finished this challenge correctly um, and correctly test against what their code or what their functionality is. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited about these APIs myself. Uh, and that is all. So uh, please rate me. I'd love, to hear, love you to do that. Uh, and if you have any questions, I'd be happy to hear those too. Okay, so we have a couple of minutes for questions. Does anybody? Okay, awesome. Hello. Uh, my question is, how do you handle errors? So let's say that the user is on one page, uh, he did some action, then he switched the context, did another actions, and at some point, the real request went to the server and something wrong happened, right? So specifically, how do we handle errors with the client framework, the Lightning Component yeah, framework, yeah? yeah? Um, so on the, uh, on the Salesforce server side, uh, you can actually make any DML, um, anything that's gonna save data. Um, you can make that either uh, as a, an all or none type of transaction, or you can say if one record fails, the rest will save correctly. Um, if you do the, the all or none, that produces an error that is then passed down to the client. And in the callback, there are several different status values that you can test for. Uh, so there's actually a status value that you can test for uh, that's error. Uh, you can also test for incomplete. So if, for instance, if my component um, goes in, fires off an action to the server, and then my user navigates away from the component, before they actually, the, the, the round trip is complete. You can handle that as a separate callback as well. Uh, so there's a number of different statuses that you can handle in the callback. I guess that's the short answer. Did that answer your question? Excellent. Hey, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, one of the things that you mentioned was caching. Yes. Um, how do y'all do that, and then do, do all of your APIs, do they implement e-tags or some sort of timestamp so that the client-side framework can handle caching in, in case they don't use the Salesforce client? Do y'all have e-tags with your APIs? So if you're writing a client application that isn't the Salesforce framework, um, so the, uh, we actually have a mobile SDK that we suggest using. And the mobile SDK uses an impl implementation of SQL Cipher. Uh, and it's pretty transparent. I've actually not built a hybrid or a, uh, a native mobile SDK app in Anger myself. I've kind of, I've done the tutorial and I've seen how it works, but I've not actually had to struggle with that myself. Um, but I do know that the SQL Cipher functionality allows for local caching and offline access, and we have a number of customers that are using that successfully so that they can do the sync um, uh, appropriately between client and server.